All right, good morning. Let's begin. It's 10.15. So good morning, everyone. Just as a reminder, this is the infection biology class at DPFL, Bio 477. It's run by my colleague and your teacher, Professor Melanie Blockesh, who's currently out of town. That's why she asked me quite some time ago, certainly before anyone knew anything about coronavirus or novel coronavirus, to give a guest lecture on epidemiology. But given recent developments, it seemed, it would have seemed bizarre to give a lecture on epidemiology and not talk about uh, coronavirus. So we agreed um, that we would make this about coronavirus. I'm trying to obviously teach you general concepts, but it would be really a missed opportunity not be able to say this is how things look like um, in the current situation. Now, it's February 26, and I'm going to say that a couple of times, and you may think, why does he keep saying it's February 26? We know it's February 26. Yes, you know, but we're also recording this. And so in the future, situation may change, and I want to make sure when people watch this in the future, so hi, everyone in the future, um, everything that's being said here is status February 26th. Um, I should also say, Time permitting, I'm happy to take a couple of questions as long as they're scientific questions. If you have questions about, you know, personal um, questions about the situation, there's a hotline um, by the government. It's very easy to find. Um, if you have questions about what should we do, these are political decisions. Uh, I'm happy to be involved if need be, but it, it's not things I can really answer here. Good. So before we get started, let's maybe get the terminology uh, sorted out. So this is, uh, we're talking about this novel coronavirus. Um, in late December, when the world started to take notes, at least officially, um, it wasn't quite clear what we were looking at. Uh, people were referring to the Wuhan virus because it um, seemed to be emerging in the city of Wuhan, which you probably heard by now. We're not using that anymore. This is um, not good practice, and it's strongly advised against um, to name diseases after people or groups of people or locations for, I think, obvious reasons. Um, you know, things like the Spanish flu has really nothing to do with Spain. Actually, the only reason why we call it Spanish flu is because Spain had a relatively free press at the time, um, in, at the end of World War I, and that's why it was called Spanish flu. Um, now, we just refer to it as pandemic influenza 1918. Same with Lyme disease or Legionnaire's disease. These are not good names. I mean, we're stuck with them, but that's why we're not calling this Wuhan virus anymore. We used to call it the novel coronavirus, but there was a process in place. There is a process in place to name these things officially that takes some time. Now it's called SARS-CoV-2, and the disease is called COVID-19 for coronavirus disease and 2019 as the year when it emerged. So SARS, as you know, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Um, there's a whole species, viral species of these SARS-related coronaviruses. There are hundreds of different strains. I'm not a virologist, okay, so please don't ask me anything about that, but they mostly circulate in bats um, and they also circulate in other animals, and they occasionally, as we have seen now twice, seem to jump um, the species barrier into humans. So SARS-CoV is the one that was responsible for the SARS outbreak, remember 2002 to 2004, and SARS-CoV-2 is now responsible for the current COVID-19 outbreak. So SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus, and COVID-19 is the name of the disease. Um, yet, even officials, for example, at WHO, you often hear the COVID-19 virus. A bit confusing, but I guess the way to think about this is you have HIV, it's the virus, you have AIDS, it's the disease, and people still talk about the AIDS virus. It's nothing per se wrong, but you should know that the ter terminology is one is the, uh, is the virus and the other is the disease. I'll mostly stick to COVID-19 throughout this lecture. This is a map. Um, as epidemiological situations go, this is already out of date. I took the screenshot last night from the WHO website. You can see Switzerland is not on there yet. Of course, today it will be. Austria as well. This is a very rapidly developing situation. Um, 
emerging situations are often like a crime scene in some sense. You have to figure out what's going on. There's a lot of things you don't know. You have to communicate a lot of things you don't know. Uh, stuff may be outdated tomorrow. <coughs> Um, but this is what the situation currently looks like. So this emerged, as you all know, from China and then spread um, to multiple countries. And I think we're now at 40 plus. But again, the uh, situation is, is rapidly changing. So in general, where do such new diseases come from? So many human infectious diseases uh, are so-called zoonoses. That means they come from animal origin, non-human animal origin. They spread. Um, the species barrier from animal to human. Um, many times this jump from an animal to then a human is a dead end for, for the virus. It may not even be uh, able to establish itself. Even if it establishes itself, it may not be able to actually transmit itself to the next human. And there's many cases like that. So rabies is a good example. Um, Bird flu, this influenza uh, H5N1 that we sometimes hear about, is also an example. It's a very nasty example because it is, when we say the human is a dead end, we actually mean that relatively literally. The human tends to die as a 60% mortality rate when you get infected with um, bird flu. So this is why outside of coronavirus, if you would ask an epidemiologist, what keeps you awake at night, they would typically mention that because we're just hoping that this doesn't find out how to spread from human to human. Um, so some of them figure out how to jump from human to human and then you can have sustained human to human uh, spread. This is, seems to be now the case with the SARS-CoV-2, was the case with the first SARS virus. MERS and so on. Sometimes also when that happens and it, the virus establishes itself so well in the human population, it can adapt to the human population in such a way that it wouldn't actually uh, be able to spread easily in its original host. This is what happened with HIV, which originally jumped from a non-human primate into humans, but now has had you know, many decades of intense uh, adaptation and is now a uniquely human virus. Um, this is another way to look at this. This is from a now relatively old paper, but I think a very good one that shows this. You have this reservoir, could be some animal species. And um, by the way, we don't currently know for sure what the reservoir or the, the, the original point from uh, the chump into the human population is. There is some idea that it could be a pangolin, but it's not yet been fully established. In any case, you can see that these are typically dead ends, and dead ends here means just for the virus or for the infection, and uh, occasionally can maybe spread, but it stutters out. Um, but eventually it, it figures out or has already figured out how to do this relatively efficiently, and that's, that's when we talk about the emergence of an infectious disease. Now, I want to structure this lecture a bit around three, four topics, and two of those are actually in the name infectious disease. Now, if you, what, what's the problem with an infectious disease? Well, it stares right at you, right? It's the two terms. It's infectious, that's the first problem, and it causes disease, that's the second problem. Uh, if it would be neither of those, we wouldn't be worried so much. Disease is always bad, but if it's not infectious, it's a different ball game. If something is infectious but causes disease, well, okay, it's infectious, but maybe we shouldn't worry too much about it. It's the combination of these two things. So let me talk a bit about disease first. So when um, an infection causes a disease, which is clearly the case for COVID now, we need to know what is the overall um, expression of that. And there can be many different types of expressions. There can be infections that actually will not cause any symptoms. Um, and it's almost certain that many of you are currently infected by some viruses that cause absolutely no symptoms in you. Um, so we call this asymptomatic. It can cause a clear disease phenotype. So you're clearly not feeling well. Um, this, but this could be relatively mild. Think of a common cold can be annoying. Sometimes it can be so bad that you maybe decide to stay a couple of days at home. But you know, 
nothing that you will remember in the future. It can, however, depending on the disease, go into a severe state where you will definitely want to get some sort of medical care. Um, and you may even need hospitalization de depending on the severity. We generally talk about critical, but again, um, you would have to talk to a clinician there for clear definitions, but you can, I guess, intuitively understand what critical means. Critical means really hospital and if not, you know, potential danger to then, um, you know, progress even further into death. And of course, sometimes you just don't know. Um, there's also always a lot of missing data. So what does the situation now look like for COVID? So one of the best data sets we have, of course, is from China because they still have by far the largest known confirmed outbreak. So this was data that was released by the Chinese CDC um, on their cases. So these were confirmed cases with symptoms, okay? That's why we're not talking here about asymptomatic. So as the WHO has also repeatedly said, the good news is that it's mostly mild, okay? Over 80% seem to have mild disease. Um, but with every good news, there's a flip side. The bad news is that means that, you know, almost 20% um, have severe or critical disease. And um, that's, of course, a big worry. Um, we sp will talk about death after, but nevertheless, these are people that need likely, you know, some sort of um, either hospitalization or medical treatment. And if you're looking at an infectious disease, that can really uh, pose a tremendous challenge for capacity planning, right? If you're in a healthcare system and you realize something is spreading that has potentially, you know, an 18.5% um, you know, rate of people developing severe critical disease, that's something you absolutely want to plan for. Just so that you know, the number of hospital beds per thousand people is a marker in countries for their readiness or the quality of the, of the healthcare system. There's hundreds of markers like that. That is one of them. Um, and in Switzerland, which has a good, very good healthcare system, that's about 4.5. That's what you find in most of the best prepared countries, some have a, a little higher, but nevertheless, right, that's half a percent. And uh, half a percent, that's of course fine, you can usually deal with that, but imagine if you all of a sudden have a lot of people coming to that system for which you haven't planned. So this is something that uh, you need to plan for. And we also know from the China data that people tended to stay multiple weeks uh, in hospitals until they could really be, um, you know, discharged or in the worst case until they died. Now let's talk about death. And this is one of the big issues at the moment. Um, we're often also asking what is the, the mortality of this thing? And that's all in the news right now. So the way we think about this is through this case fatality ratio. This case fatality ratio simply asks, okay, I have a number of cases, how many of those um, die as a consequence of the infection. So basically you have numbers of deaths uh, per number of cases. Now in an ongoing outbreak, this is a very challenging thing because you're of course tempted to just say, okay, please give me the number of deaths so far and give me the number of cases so far and they divide one by the other and we're done. But that's, um, that's very problematic. Um, so one of the problems here is that, you know, let's talk about the deaths. The issue is you're not yet seeing all the deaths because there's a lot of people in an ongoing situation that are infected and that are unfortunately going to die, but they're not part of your number of deaths yet. So you're actually underestimating the number of deaths and therefore you're underestimating this case fatality ratio. On the flip side, well, maybe not flip side, but on the other um, side of this division, you have the number of cases. Well you are looking at a certain number of cases and these are cases you have actually found. You have identified these as cases, but there may be many infected that you have not identified. For some reason, um, could be a question of surveillance system, could be a question of um, you know, many mild or even asymptomatic. So you may actually underestimate this number. This number here, number of cases may be much bigger. And that of course would be good because if that number is bigger, that will bring this case fatality ratio down. So these are two forces sort of pulling at different ends. Um, 
we have statistical ways a bit to deal with it and usually express these things then in confidence intervals. If you're asking, well, what is the data? Well, the, the pure data from China reported this at 2.3% because 1,023 people died. These were the number of confirmed cases, 44,000 and something. So very quickly, people made the division and said, okay, we have a case fatality rate of 2.3. Now, again, this is, you know this is not going to be correct for the two reasons that I just mentioned and some other reasons as well. But you can also look at other data. There's statistical ways to deal with it. Colleagues at the University of Bern, Christian Althaus and his colleagues keep um, a GitHub repository where they're daily updating the data and the estimates. The last time I checked, which was this morning, was, was at 1.6% with a 95% confidence interval of 0.4 and 4.1. So can go still either way, but the window or the, this confidence interval is now narrowing. Um, the WHO has also recently started to use another term, which is infection fatality ratio. The idea here is to deal exactly with this complication that what do you mean by case? Case usually means you know, confirmed. Um, and also depending on which clinical setting you are, it, it means, you know, uh, cases that actually express disease. So there's a lot of confusion actually about the term case. So whenever you read something in the news that says cases, you always need to ask yourself, what do they mean by case? And also in an emerging situation, case definitions change very rapidly. So they use this estimate for infection fatality ratio. So that's the same, um, but it's just now instead of numbers of deaths per cases, it's number of deaths per all infected confirmed, suspected, and unreported. Of course, you don't know unreported, but you can make estimates. And they put that um, at 0.94%. And again, of course, with some confidence interval. So by and large, um, if you look at some of the best labs in the world, the best groups in the world, official uh, health authorities, WHO and so on, we have to assume a death rate of 1%. How does this compare to other diseases? Well, there's some very, very nasty diseases like Ebola, and as I mentioned, H5N1 avian influenza, that basically is not very kind to its carriers, at least its human carriers, and kills people at a very high rate. So Ebola is anywhere between 50 and 90%, avian influenza somewhere around 60%. Um, we probably know this relatively well because that's something that's very visible, obviously. But um, other diseases, you know, just, just um, for the record, right, many of these numbers are st still, e even after an outbreak, with a lot of uncertainty, because you, you'll never know how many cases you missed until you did some kind of study on the entire population. Um, SARS, we think the first, so the SARS, right, 2002, had about a 10% mortality rate. That's why people were really, really scared and concerned about that when that happened. 1918 influenza, there's a whole range of estimates from 2.5 to over 10. It's very hard to say because we don't know how many people were infected. We think it's about a third of the world's population at the time, which was about 1.5 billion people. So about half a billion people. Now the question is how many people died? As you can imagine, healthcare systems at the time, very primitive. In fact, we didn't know influenza virus in 1918. But the latest puts it at around four to 5%. So this was pretty bad. Seasonal influenza is usually topping out at 0.1%, usually topping out. So um, pandemic H1N1 flu, 2009, for those of you who remember, turned out to be a relatively mild one with a case fatality ratio of 0.05. So, COVID finds itself somewhere here in between. That's just what we know. So statements around this idea that when it comes to mortality, COVID seems to be about seasonal influenza are just not tenable at this point on February 26, 2020. Now, these case fatality ratios are not fixed numbers. They depend on a lot of things. Um, 
one of the data points that was released um, by, by the Chinese CDC was a strong age effect and um, a colleague, Jesse Metcalf at Princeton, very quickly made a graph of this because it's so striking and put it on Twitter. And, and here's what you see. So this is the case fatality ratio or some people call it rate. It's the same thing. And this is the age. So you can see this is here relatively, ro relatively low, but then picking up at around 50 and really starting to shoot up at 60, 70 and 80. So that age range here is really quite dramatically affected. I think the actual number was 14.8% uh, for, for people between 80, uh, over 80. Um, again, this is the Chinese data. It will always be interesting to see how that changes from geography to geography, but that's currently um, the data we have to work with. Um, this is very different, for example, from influenza and, and pandemic influenzas, especially in the past, where we saw especially also a lot of young people uh, infected. So if there's, if there's any good news, but I'm not really sure I could call this good news, um, because deaths are deaths, but sometimes epidemiological math is a bit brutal. Um, I think most people would say we'd much rather have it affect elderly people than younger people. Again, this is not a judgment on any value of life, but for, for various um, you know, transmission dynamics also, because kids go to schools and, and uh, elderly people are mostly at home. Um, she also observed, of course, that the age distribution of different populations are very different. As you know, we live here in Europe in uh, populations that are rather old, comparatively speaking, where there's a lot of people um, you know, in, in terms of frequencies, in terms of fractions that are in those age classes. And then if you go perhaps on the African continent, that's certainly not the case where most people are very young. So that's going to hit them in some sense differently. The flip side of that is, of course, that part of the reason why we have many old people is because we have very good healthcare systems. And so that may, again, sort of tip the balance. But these are now things, right, epidemiologists immediately start to think about and put together data and cross-reference data and make predictions about what could happen. Um, another thing that was shown, um, this death um, case fatality ratio had strong um, dependency on comorbid conditions. That's still very much, you know, in the making, as you can see, missing data, a lot of missing data, right? Half of the data, this wasn't known. But where it was known, you can see here that these case fatality ratios were um, at times rather elevated depending on whether there were some background mortalities. And we very often hear that now in the news, um, sorry, background morbidities. We very often hear that now in the news um, when people die, it tends to be um, older people and it tends to be people with, with already background conditions. Good. As I mentioned, um, this, all of this is very important for planning. Um, again, each single death is tragic and we definitely need to think about death, but we should not forget to also talk about hospitalization and clinical cases of so severe and critical because they will put major stresses on healthcare infrastructure. And, and that may then have downstream effects where people are already uh, treated for other issues, for example, the flu, complicated cases of the flu or anything else. And this may be, you know, complicated. Infectious diseases also require special infrastructure. You can't just say, oh, here's two extra beds, let's just put them there, right? It's, if they have something that you absolutely want to contain, you must have a proper setup. Um, again, hospital beds, um, there's only so many, so uh, we really need to plan this well and typically, right, this should be planned ahead, not only when it just happens. Um, and once it starts spreading, and, and we'll talk about this in the second hour, then mitigation becomes the major effort where you say we just want to keep this number low for, for as, as long as we can, also to relieve the burden on the healthcare system. Okay, so that's about disease. Now let me talk about the other term that is a problem with infectious disease, which is infectious. So these things spread, right? They spread from one person to another person in one way or another. So as you are, again, just put yourself into sort of a crime scene situation, right? You're trying to solve this case. What you need to know is 
well, okay, how to how many? I mean, if there's a person that's infected, to how many other people will that person transmit uh, this infection? How? What are the, the modes of transmission? When does that happen? Does that happen when a person is already diseased, symptomatic? Does it happen before? How many days, weeks, and so on? Who? Who does get infected, right? And who passes it on? Who is infectious? These are all things you need to know. We, in general, can think of this as if, if we want to just get a first shot at this, um, there's a, a great concept um, that's called R, and I will now briefly explain what that is. It's the reproduction number of an infectious disease. So imagine here, right? And maybe I should use this um, high-tech tool. Um, you have here this, um, this first case at the top. And let's say you observe that this first case infects two um, you know, new cases, and each of those two then also infect two, and each of those two also infect two. So now you're starting to see a picture, and you're saying, okay, on average, uh, a person seems to infect two new people. So this is very worrying, right? Because if that's the case, you realize, okay, we need to get this under control very rapidly, because um, eight people will pass it on to 16, to 32, and so on. You realize, right, exponential growth, this will literally explode. Um, sometimes you are looking at slightly more complicated situation where you say, well, this person seems to have infected one person. Oops, excuse me. Uh, then this other person, the next case also seems to have infected one case, at least that we know of. Right? It's always a lot of uncertainty. But then it seems like there was a so-called super spreading event where then the next infections from that case were really massive. And so we call this super spreading event. We, we try to not speak about super spreaders because again, for the same reason in an emerging situation, we, you know, stigmatization is the last thing we need. And certainly, you know, such a person did certainly not want to spread uh, this to many other people. And there can be many different reasons why super spreading events can happen, um, but they can happen it's currently not quite clear. In the beginning, we thought there are probably many in COVID. Um, eventually, we said there's probably not so many. Now the tide, again, seems to be turning a bit, that there could be some. So we know relatively little at the moment what seems to be the case. But anyways, you can then still sort of say, OK, over a number of generations, we get so and so many cases. And that allows you then to, um, to come up with this so-called reproduction number. And it comes in two forms basic and effective. So the basic is the one that's usually called R0 or R0. Not. not does not stand for not, but for not. So the, the Brits among you will, will laugh at me, but it it's, uh, stands for the, the zero right at the beginning. Um, so that's really at the very beginning. What is that number at the very beginning? It's a great concept where you think, okay, you have a population. That population is completely naive immunologically to this new virus. Now you, you see that this virus, right? It, it jumps from, from an animal or so. And now the question is this first case, how many secondary cases will it cause in this completely naive population on average? And so then that is R naught because now you can assume that this is now going to happen if there's no mitigation, that then these R new cases will also infect R new cases and so on. So now you can do the math, you can project and so on. Um, the effective reproduction number is then just that number as the epidemic progresses. From a purely biological um, case uh, perspective, right? Every infectious disease will eventually run its course because it will simply run out of susceptibles. You know, just imagine we were the entire population here um, we had an R of a disease. I had this disease at first. I would pass it on to two people, okay, R not two. Then they would pass it on to four. Uh, they would pass it on to eight. They may be 16, but already then there will be some people that are immune. And so that number will actually go down. By the time, you know, half of this room would have the disease, the number would go further down. And then eventually the number would drop um, to eventually then close to zero. So this, you know, if you look at animal populations are also diseases in plants, by the way, of course, you know, plants also have diseases. This is, this is what happens. 
Um, but this is, of course, not what we want to bank on as humans when we're looking at an emerging disease. What we actually want to do is, if we realize this R is bigger than one in the beginning, this is a condition for an outbreak, right? We need each case to infect more cases, more than one, for you to have an outbreak. Otherwise, you're not going to have growth. So you need to know what this number is so you have a sense of how fast this is going to be. But then your job as an epidemiologist, as you know, all of us public health officials, will be to bring this R down. Okay? R is not a property of the pathogen alone. It's a property of the host. It's a property of the transmission system. It's everything. It's, it's many, many reasons um, how that many aspects influence R and we have to try to bring R down below one because if it goes to one, then the outbreak will remain somewhat stable. If we manage it to get it below one, it will then go down and eventually die out. So that's an important concept, right? Stopping an ongoing outbreak means bringing R below one. And this is also why you wanna know R in the beginning because bringing R from two to one is easier than bringing it from three to one or bringing it from five to one and so on. So this is a very important concept. How do you actually measure that? Well, again, if you run some computational model or in the real world, you know, uh, sorry, in the ideal world, you know everything. You know who's infected, you know who infected whom, so you can calculate this. In the real world, you don't have that luxury. You do not know who is infected in the beginning. You do not know who infected whom. All you eventually start to see is some sort of epidemic curve. So you can use this epidemic curve to then estimate the R. There's many methods and one can teach entire courses on that topic alone, which I'm certainly not gonna do here, but you can um, estimate this number if you know the shape of this curve, the numbers in time. And if you also know a few important aspects about epidemiology, namely, you need to know the incubation period. We'll talk about this uh, in a minute. That's the time period from getting infected to showing symptoms. And the latency period or the latent period, that's a time of a person becoming infected and then becoming infectious. So having the ability to pass the infection on. If you have this, these numbers, then you can start to estimate this. The problem is, of course, especially in the beginning, a lot of this information is unclear as health uh, care systems are struggling to keep this under control. This data will emerge very, very, very slowly and will have a lot of uncertainty. So again, our estimates are that sense variable. They also come with a confidence interval. So just again, to get, to get the, the, um, the terminology straight, because that's very important, let's say you have a person here that's infection, and infected from somewhere. Um, now, this person is neither infectious nor symptomatic in the very beginning. Typically, the infection tries to establish itself. That takes some time. Um, and then eventually, um, disease can kick in. The person can become symptomatic. And that time period we call the incubation period. Um, at the same time, the person may eventually become infectious. Um, and none of these things need to happen. It can also be that the person does not become infectious. It can also be that the person does not become symptomatic. But in the normal cases, quote unquote, this is what happens. And these are the two numbers you need to know. Because then you can imagine at some time during that infectious period here of the first case, that person may pass it on to another infection. And this then we call the generation time, right? From, the, from one infection to the next infection. And of course it's variable because you never know. Well, first of all, all of these are biological properties. All of these are variable, but um, also then when during the infectious period do you actually infect people? So we take averages, but then you know, we have a distribution and we can say, okay, the mean uh, generation time is X, Y, Z. So these are the numbers. Now for COVID, currently the data, February 26, 2020, suggests that this period is somewhere between two and 14 days. Okay, so when people get infected after two to 14 days, they start to develop 
symptoms. This is, by the way, also the reason why when you do quarantine, and quarantine, I should here take a moment to explain what this is because there's a bit of confusion. Quarantine is putting away or isolating, if you will, people who are not sick, but who could have been exposed and may become infectious. When you take people who are already sick and you isolate them, then we speak of isolation. But so let's say you now have a situation, and of course, this is exactly what happened yesterday in Switzerland. We realized, okay, there is a case, case is confirmed in uh, the Italian speaking part of Switzerland. Now that person is obviously, um, well, depending on their status, but it's an infection. You know, this person is infected. So certainly you're gonna isolate this, this person, but now everyone that this person was in contact with could be infected and you don't want them to infect other people. So they are now put under quarantine. It could turn out that they're not infected. It could turn out that, yeah, that they never become infected or infectious. And then of course you can release them, but you don't know until a certain time. And currently the recommendation there is 14 days, but that may change, it may increase. Unfortunately, it looks like the incubation period um, for COVID is slightly larger than um, the latent period. This was not the case for SARS. For SARS, it was a bit the other way around. Why is that unfortunate? Well, if you look at this graph here, right, you can really see that time window here is the most problematic one, where when someone is infectious, but not yet symptomatic. So that person is transmitting the disease, not even feeling unwell. And you know, if, if the incubation period is much larger than the latent period, then you have a large time frame where people can spread the disease without ever knowing that they actually have it. This is obviously problematic. Um, that's also, by the way, a bit the nasty thing typically with, with influenza, that people seem to be infectious just a bit before, say a day before they start to develop symptoms. Um, with SARS, that wasn't the case, thankfully. Um, people started to become infectious a few days after they started to develop symptoms. And that really also allowed the system to track uh, all of these cases and isolate them and then eventually, um, you know, stop the outbreak. Like SARS didn't just go away. Um, it was because the healthcare system was really effective at that time and this helped. But for, um, for COVID, it looks like that is not necessarily going to help us. So maybe the burning question that you have, well, okay, so please tell us what this R number is. And so here is what it is. Um, it is somewhere between two and three, that's the current estimates. Um, this again, unfortunately, is slightly higher than seasonal flu. Seasonal flu, we think is somewhere between one and two. Of course, always depends on the season. Again, lots of uncertainty there. Um, this was a graph that was created during the Ebola situation a few years ago, where people just wanted to show what is actually this reproductive uh, number of different diseases. And you can see here, hepatitis C around two, uh, Ebola around two, HIV around four, SARS around four. So SARS was more contagious. Um, mumps, childhood diseases tend to be very nasty when it comes to that, measles, Okay, we think it's somewhere between 15 and 20. It's the most contagious disease known to humans. This is why we're really relatively strict on measles and asking people to get vaccinated against the measles because it's the most contagious disease that we know, at least in humans. So next question for you, if you're looking at this outbreak would be, how does transmission happen? Okay, seems to be one case seems to be causing on average somewhere between two and three new cases, which is problematic because to contain this, you now want to bring this number to one or below. <laughs> so one of the key things you need to know is um, how does transmission happen? And there are many ways infectious diseases can spread. Um, some of them I've pointed out here. Um, the first two are typically the case droplet and airborne with respiratory diseases, influenza, again, SARS, COVID, and so on. Um, let me maybe show you the next picture, right? You've probably seen this. 
Um, but you know, every time you, you cough, uh, sneeze in particular also, um, but in fact, every time you breathe and exhale, there are particles coming out of your mouth and you know this whenever you're in some situation and the sunlight just goes in front of you and you see, you see this very well. This is of course an extreme case of a sneezing. What you can see here nicely though is that these, these particles here of mucus are not all of equal size. There's a distribution. Some are very large, comparatively speaking, some are very small. Um, so they may contain viral particles. Now, if they're very large, we call them droplets. Droplets are so large that um, the force of gravity is strong enough that, that they get pulled to the ground very quickly. And that's actually very active research in and of itself. I think some of even done here at the PFL, um, but that the distance there is quite critical. We usually think of it around two meters, one to two, maybe sometimes three, which would mean if that were the, were the main way of transmitting the disease, then you know, a radius of two, three meters is sort of the exposure zone, if you will. Uh, so if, you, if someone is you know, in some situation somewhere in a room and you realize that person's symptomatic, and you don't go close to that person, then you know, there's no way of transmitting the disease um, through that route. So that's an important um, you know, distinction because the smaller particles through other forces can remain suspended in the air. And um, you know, that's of course a problem um, because then first of all, that distance doesn't make any sense anymore. The additional problem is depending how long viral particles remain alive and infectious, um, you know, you could be in a room where the original infected person is not even in that room anymore. So we think that's, for example, the case for measles, where the current thinking is that um, that can be up to two hours after exposure. So you could be in a room uh, where a person with the measles is currently infectious has left two hours ago and you could still inhale infectious particles. Now, hopefully you're all vaccinated against the measles, but just as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example, it's actually quite shocking to me that we still don't know the relative importance of these, even for something like influenza. We have assumed for a long time, influenza is mostly transmitted through droplets, but new data that has come out in recent months and years has suggested that airborne may be quite an important uh, transmission as well. Um, this is also why we really continue to recommend good ventilation, because of course good ventilation cleans the room of the air. Fomite is another important one. Um, fomite just means through object surfaces. So um, if I'm somewhere and I'm you know coughing or breathing or, you know, yeah, coughing in my hand and then touching a handle, you know, maybe a knob or, or a handle in a toilet. Um, I may deposit obviously viral particles on that surface. And then you come in a few minutes later or possibly a few hours later and you touch that and now you have it on your hands. And then you touch your face, which we do apparently hundreds of times a day if we're not careful. And this is how you may infect yourself. So fomite is thought to be very important and this of course, also part of the reason why one of the major recommendations right now is hand washing and hand washing and hand washing. It's not because anyone thinks you have dirty hands, it's because that's a very common way of picking up um, exposed uh, surfaces, particles from exposed surfaces and then bringing it into your system. There's bodily fluids, of course, the whole blood, semen and so on. That's, you know, think of Ebola, think of sexually transmitted diseases. Um, there's a fecal oral route, think of pretty much any um, gastrointestinal um, disease where it's shed through stool. Um, here we don't know yet if that's the case, that would be surprising, um, but there have been a few papers by Chinese researchers finding viral particles in stool. We don't know yet if that's therefore a transmission route, but there's a question mark around that. Um, so at the moment, the assumption is droplet and fomite for, for COVID as the major um, uh, modes. 
There's other ways, of course, you all know vector-borne disease. So all of these are somewhat direct ways, but vector-borne diseases when, for example, uh, yeah, another animals, most famously, of course, mosquito, picks up the disease from you, uh, the infection, and then transmits it somewhere else. Uh, malaria, chikungunya, Zika, you name it, those kinds of diseases. Waterborne, also a lot of research here at EPFL, um, especially in relation with the fecal oral. If you have a disease, gives you diarrhea, um, and you have a, a healthcare system that gets water from some common pot without cleaning it, very bad. For example, cholera. Again, we don't think of these as relevant in the COVID situation. In the COVID situation, we currently mostly think about droplet and fomite, but we just don't know what is the, relevant, re, uh, the relative contribution with, um, with others as well. Um, it is now 11 o'clock, so we'll make a 15 minute break and then we come back. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. So, just a reminder, we're February 26, 2020. Um, we're at EPFL in the Bio 477 Infection Biology class. This is a guest lecture on epidemiology. So, I want to just uh, go to the next slide here. Um, and show you some more data on what we just talked about, this whole question about transmission modes, infection, and so on. So this is very interesting data, um, again, from Chinese colleagues um, that took throat and nasal swabs from infected patients and, um, and analyzed that for viral activity. So if you look at this graph, it's not important to go into the details of what this um, value means and, and why it's actually reverse. Um, but just know that the higher up in the graph, the higher the viral load. Okay, so up here is high viral load and down here is low viral load. Um, and you can see the difference in the throat and nasal swaps. So again, one of the somewhat... Um, concerning features of COVID is that um, there seems to be quite some viral load in the nasal and throat passage pretty much at onset of symptoms. And we may have reasons to suspect that this has even started before, but it's too early to really have systematic data on that because you would need to be able also to swap people that are not infectious. And that's certainly work that's going on, but we don't uh, at the moment know. Again, February 26. Um, and you can also see that this eventually gets cleared over time. Um, but again, the, the pattern is somewhat different um, from SARS and a bit more similar to the flu. Um, so with SARS, again, the viral loads peaked about 10 days after symptoms onset. It was it typically began a few days already after it, but then really peaked. And that gave us this great window of opportunity where we could really isolate patients and make sure they don't infect anyone else. We don't seem to have that luxury with COVID um, according to this data. Um, another um, important uh, observation here, of course, that you can see there's quite some activity also in the nasal swaps. Right? In any respiratory disease, um, your system can be um, infected in, in multiple ways, um, lungs, throat, nasal passage, and so on. And that, of course, has direct me mechanical implications on how you eject these viral particles. Things that are in the lung are mostly ejected through coughs, um, things that are in the nasal passage can be uh, ejected through, you know, mucus through the nose, um, through the nose, or through um, um, through other means as well. But but the point is that um, it's, as people keep reminding everyone, if you put on a mask, right, you have to put it over your nose as well, and that's of course the reason for it. It's not that anyone wants to make your breathing uncomfortable it's that this may be also major exhaust, if you will, for viral particles when you sneeze, for example. Good, so 
now we had this discussion in the first hour about these two parts, um, infectious and disease, which are two major things you want to know as you, as you deal with an infectious disease. Um, if then, you know, you do the right things and, and all the, the, the property of the virus and the host are lined up, you may then get this under control quickly or you may not. And that's, of course, a big question right now, where people are asking themselves, well, is this now a pandemic? Because in the, in the beginning, everyone was careful to not call this a pandemic because it was very much um, focused on China. Um, it's now becoming clear that the word pandemic seems to be the main problem. Um, just at a press conference, um, recently, you know, the WHO said using the word pandemic now does not fit the facts, but it may certainly cause fear. So you can very clearly see that the main concern about using the P word there uh, was not about the actual epidemiology, but about the, the perception of that word. And then further down, you know, we must focus on containment, so keeping this thing from spreading broadly, uh, while doing everything we can to prepare for a potential pandemic. So I'll be a bit, you know, I'm not the WHO, um, and that's a good thing, but um, in, in my mind and that of many of my colleagues were a bit mincing words, if we don't call this a pandemic, um, and it's not clear who's that going to really help. It may be a reflection of the old system where everything, sort of all the communication was channeled through one channel, namely the experts. And that's just not the world we live in. You can call it pandemic or not. People will already be speaking of a pandemic. And then, in fact, this may be even problematic in my view, because then people are thinking, well, what, what, what are we not being told? So that's not a, a real worry, of course, because I think one of the great things about this outbreak is that we just saw how quickly information was spread from everyone, from the people on the ground, collecting the data, immediately sharing, the WHO sharing data very quickly, every single day, multiple times. So I'm not quite sure why we cannot actually name this thing what it is. Um, of course, I see the problem also is that we have actually used the word pandemic in the past in a bit the strange way, right? So when you think about where the word epidemic comes from, it's a simply combination of the Greek words epi and demos, one meaning upon, the other meaning people. So things that spread in the population. And by the way, there's not only infectious disease epidemics, there can also be epidemics of uh, non-infectious uh, disease. Uh, we can, for example, speak of nutritional epidemiology. We can speak of you know, cancer epidemiology. I mean, just people um, being interested in why does something you know, become more or less frequent and what are the causes for that? And how can we potentially stop that? In many cases, and certainly in the case here, because you're in the class infection biology, we talk about, of course, infectious disease epidemiology. So that's somewhat clearly defined. Pandemic, now pan, as you, you know what that word means, it just means essentially now it's global. And if you want to go even deeper, it has sustained transmission in multiple geographies. And that's, that's very clearly what, what we have now. So, um, you know, according to such a definition, it is a pandemic, but the word has been used in different ways. So seasonal influenza, which comes every year, is always a pandemic in that sense, because it always infects uh, the world. But we don't call it pandemic there. We specifically reversed, reserved the term for um, novel strains that were new, such as the, 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 the least one was the, the, the latest one, most recent one was the 2009 influenza A, H1N1. We call it that a pandemic, but then not what happened in 2010 and 2011 and, and in each, each year since. Um, the 1918 one we call a pandemic, 57, 68, and so on. We've reserved that term, really. So it was already a slightly confusing term to begin with. And now there's this fear, um, you know, attached to the term. But um, from a pure scientific perspective and the root of the word, we can, by and large, um, now agree. Yes, okay, I mean, if you think of this as an epidemic that has multiple 
um, you know, geo geographies where there is sustained transmission. This is a pandemic and it, uh, I think it's just a question of time that the world accepts this as a fact. Um, as you know, as of today, we have multiple local outbreaks outside of China. Um, we're certainly concerned about the situation in Japan, South Korea, Italy and Iran. If you read a bit the news this morning, there's quite a bit of concern that that actually may also be the case in the US that it simply hasn't been detected. We'll see, but most epidemiologists think that this is now spreading in multiple um, locations outside of China. And of course, another big worry, potentially even the biggest, is what is happening in poorer countries? What is happening in the so-called low and middle income countries where they don't have the healthcare systems, where they don't have the um, the, the similar surveillance. I mean, of course they have healthcare system and of course they have surveillance, but maybe not at the necessary level to really track this. And then of course you have the complications of, of governments that are not very forthcoming um, with this information. And uh, so there is just a general assumption and I think it's a very, very valid assumption that there um, is likely a lot of undetected spread in those countries as well. So, you know, closing the eyes and saying, well, we don't know it for sure, is certainly going to help absolutely nobody. Um, so I'd rather be um, us up front and say, okay, you know what, we, we, we have to treat this as a pandemic. We have to treat it as a relatively infectious one because it's R is bigger than influenza. We have to treat it as a relatively severe one because the mortality is uh, current data, at least suggests that it's about 10 times um, as, as deadly as a seasonal influenza. And so let's just plan for that and be ready because um, that's the best that we can do. So in the beginning, you're in a so-called containment phase where you try to contain this, right? It breaks out, you try to contain it. It worked with SARS. Um, it now seems that it may not work um, for COVID. That's not because we have somehow gotten worse at doing this. In fact, we've gotten much better, but of the, some of the properties of this infection that I, that I showed you before. So um, now we get into a phase that we will largely describe about mitigation. And um, that's what I, what I wanna go into a bit this hour. Uh, and then at the end, I'll talk a bit about digital aspects as well. So, this is a very simplified view, obviously, of the world, but you know, you get a good understanding of what I mean. You start with containment and eventually um, you hope to manage the situation and really control the outbreak before it goes into the next phase. But once it does go into the next phase where you realize you do have now many uh, much uh, uh, spread that you can't track anymore, you need to go into mitigation mode, okay? So, um, in, at that point, you, you are essentially accepting that you cannot contain it anymore. Um, but now you must uh, focus very strongly on minimizing the number of cases. Why would you do that? In order to minimize the burden on the healthcare systems and to gain time to develop pharmaceutical interventions. And here we mostly talk about um, drugs that you can give to people uh, once they are infected or ill, so you can reduce the severity or potentially even the infectiousness, but mostly we're talking about severity. Um, and of course, vaccines, which would be the real uh, killer weapon here that we want so that people don't even get infected or at least much, much less. Um, that's, that's very important, right? Um, so there sometimes, of course, because I look a lot at the media and Twitter and so on, there is this sense of, well, okay, but if it's now out of the bag, so to speak. Cats out of the bag, so why bother? So this is very much the wrong way to think about this, right? We must, it becomes now just as important to bother as it was before. This figure from the CDC, I think is a great illustration of that where you would see, right? If, if you don't do anything, if you just say, well, okay, cats out of the bag, let's just let this thing spread. You would get this massive and rapid epidemic Peak. And again, we, we could model this, uh, which is what we do heavily, um, because you know now some of the numbers, right? The incubation period are not and so on. Um, and if you mitigate though, you will, it, the curve, um, the goal is to make the curve, the epidemic curve more look like this, right? It's flatter because you're mitigating, 
but you're not really, um, I mean, it, it is nevertheless going to spread. Um, so you're just buying yourself some time, right? You're flattening the curve and you're, you're putting cells, uh, things more into the future. And this has two very important effects. First of all, you don't want to run a healthcare system under this situation, right? Because all of a sudden you have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that need to be hospitalized. And that's on top of everything that you're already dealing with. So that would really overburden any health system. So reducing the number of cases, right? So you reduce the demand on hospitals and health infrastructure. So that's the first thing. The second thing, thing is just to push this out to make sure all of that happens later, right? And why is that? Well, for the simple reason that it takes us time. It buys us time because it takes us time to develop vaccines and to, to develop drugs. Um, with influenza, you know, we're always relatively certain that we can develop a good vaccine or, you know, at least some vaccine. I mean, the, the efficacy of uh, influenza vaccines varies from, from year to year. But if you were around and following this um, in 2009, that was sort of the big, the big that, was, that was clear, right? This, this thing started spreading in, in April um, 2009, if I'm not, not completely mistaken. And we knew at the time, you know, once we have the virus isolated, um, we can start developing a vaccine that would then come on the market about a half year later through because of the way um, we still develop vaccines. Now, if we can be here with COVID in the same time range, that's not clear. It may take longer. Um, I'm not sure if there's a worst case that we need to think about that there may be no vaccine. I think currently most people are expecting that there will be a vaccine. It's just, of course, at this point, not clear how effective it's going to be and when it's going to come. But clearly, we would put all of our science on that and try to come up with this as fast as we can. And multiple labs and hundreds of thousands of people around the world are already working nonstop on this. And so you just want to buy time to do that. Right, so, so um, as someone said this morning, also on Twitter, um, if I have to get COVID, I'd rather get it in six months than today, for that simple reason. Okay, because we may then have something, or you know, ideally only in 12 months. Uh, of course, ideally never get it, but um, if you get it, right, you just want to make sure this this is um, spread into the future as much as possible. So these are the two reasons. So if you hear people saying, you know. Well, why should we do that? These, these are the two answers you have to give to them. Um, now, to maybe go really deep, and this is not to worry you, but again, we, we, um, we're scientists, right? So we must, we must confront the facts as they present themselves. Um, we have to also plan for, for what if scenarios, and, and I'm gonna show you a few um, and again, it is February 26th, okay? So there's a lot of things we don't know, and there's a lot of speculation here, but that's what you do, right, when you plan. You sort of say, what, what's the range of things that could happen? Um, for some time now, my sense is that in the public health sphere, this has been downplayed a little bit. Um, so now, you know, it's high time that we're looking at these numbers in a realistic way. So how many people actually do we expect to get infected here? If this thing really turns into a full-blown pandemic, which we now think it does. Well, um, if you look at the flu and if you ask yourself, how many people get infected by the flu each year, that's somewhere in the order of 10%. Can sometimes be more, can sometimes be less. Depends, of course, on a lot of things. Depends on the viral strain, depends on the vaccine, uh, depends on, um, you know, the... the how, how well the healthcare systems are prepared and so on. Many factors, but ballpark, excuse me, 10% of the world, right? So about, you know, ballpark um, 80 million people. Uh, sorry, 800 million people. And that is um, despite some cross immunity and, and vaccines. Um, if, if, it's, if it's pandemic influenza, which which doesn't say anything about this geographic range. Again, pandemic influenza, pandemic is just used to say this is a new strain. That's important because we expect to have very little or, or less background immunity than normally. 
Um, there, it's typically more in the order of a third of the population worldwide that gets infected. Right? So the assumption is that a third of the global population got infected with influenza A H one N one. If you actually um, put this in a model, which again we always do, and by the way, if you don't know what I mean, maybe you should have a slide. But, but we're not looking at this stuff completely unprepared. Um, infectious disease modelers have been able to model infectious disease spread in somewhat realistic situations for many years and in fact decades. In the beginning, this was mostly a mathematical exercise. Now, of course, it's a highly computational exercise. But there you can run through some models and say, and what if scenarios and run a million different versions and say, what if we do this? What if we do that? It's very important. It has finally, it's taken the field a long time to take this really seriously. Finally, um, this is really happening. If you read the, the WHO reports, you can hear, hear very often uh, modeling being referenced. And it's of course, as it should be. I mean, nobody would talk about the weather without any serious discussion about how this stuff is actually modeled. So in infectious disease, we're now also really heavily using and relying on models. So if you, if you build a model where you say, okay, let, let me put an infectious agent with an R of two to three um, and these various properties into the system and see how many people it infects without mitigation, okay, without any intervention. Well, you'll find that it, it will infect almost everyone. Yes, it will eventually run its course as we talked about in the first hour, but in doing so it has infected almost everyone. So, Mark Lipsitch is a, a colleague and really one of the most esteemed um, epidemiologists in the world. He runs the Harvard um, School of Public Health and um, he's um, very active on Twitter and a great source, by the way. So certainly someone to follow if you're interested. He recently mentioned, um, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal and then also in the Atlantic that, that he expects that 40 to 70 percent of the population get infected, and people were a bit shocked. Say, how, how can you how can you possibly say that? Um, but again, as he as he correctly um, argues, I mean, in, in a normal model where you have this assumption, you would easily get to 80 to 90 percent. And of course, then again, you can have multiple assumptions that change, and you know, issues about seasonality, which we'll talk about, mixing patterns, how are people are people actually interacting. And these may change the numbers a little bit, but you know you should probably expect this. To to his um, credit, um, also that was about ten or two weeks, uh, ten days or two weeks ago. So I just saw last night that he updated his thread to say he's still sticking with the forty to seventy percent figure, but. Um, but he mostly means adults because we just don't see a lot of cases in um, children. Um, and of course, he also reminds everyone, and I would like to do the same, right? These are now numbers under the assumption that nobody does anything, um, which we're of course not going to do, right? We're going to do something, but th these are, you know, worst case scenarios that you have to plan for. Um, you know, this is very um, concerning math, but again, we have to do that. Um, if you just, take these numbers, and again, there's much more, um, you know, realistic complications and lots of uncertainty, but ballpark, you can now say, okay, let me assume a scenario where indeed only 10% get infected. I'm not sure um, that's currently a good scenario, but you know, maybe with mitigation, 40% and sort of worst case, quote unquote, 70%, then um, we have to assume a case fatality ratio of 1%. I mean, we could, of course, also assume a higher one if we wanted to plan for really the worst. But maybe let's be also optimistic here and say, well, you know, we can, we can get this down because some people still say it's about as bad as the flu. Okay, that's a math for them. Um, and then something in between. And then you come up with these rather astonishing numbers, right? Where you say, okay, I mean, we're looking potentially at 35 million deaths um, that, is, that are just caused by COVID on top of everything else, right? It's not like uh, COVID says, okay, well, or the flu says, I'm gonna go away, right, while you're here. This is on top of everything else. 
And I don't know, you know, how anyone cannot plan seriously for this. This is not math that has just recently come out, right? You, you can do this way before. And of course, people have been doing it. But the question is, have um, healthcare systems realistically started to plan for this? Um, now, with mitigation, we can, of course, manage these numbers. Again, that's the goal, right? You're trying to manage these numbers. Now, without drugs or a vaccine, there's relatively little, I think, what we can do about the case fatality ratio. Um, with drugs and with a vaccine, of course, we can try to bring that down massively, and that's the hope. Um, what we can do before we have this is to try and work on this number, right, and try to bring this down with mitigation um, until drugs and vaccines are available. And that's just another way of showing you the same insight as this curve, right, where you're trying to reduce this um, at least for some time being so that, um, uh, so that the number of the, this, this base population that you assume is actually also lower for a certain amount of time. How do we do this? So I think a good way to think about mitigation is to think about networks, right? Think of the hosts, so in this case, unfortunately, that's us humans, um, as nodes in a network and any potential transmission from one person to the next as an edge. And that edge can be many things, right? In, in a normal um, biology class, right, I would, this is probably where I would hear explained, this depends on the mode of transmission, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a vector-borne disease, it could simply mean you happen to share, unfortunately, the same mosquito, uh, something like that. But it can also be physical distance, whatever, right, consider this a probability of transmission from one person to the next. So um, it's a combination of factors. Now, what we essentially want to do is we want to reduce these probabilities of transmission as much as possible. In an ideal world, of course, we wanted to completely break apart this network and make all the edges go away and we would have no more disease. And that's, of course, in some sense, exactly what an effective vaccine does. It breaks these edges because once you have an effective vaccine, a person cannot get infected, and so that edge goes away. But in the absence of such things, we can at least reduce this. And when people start to talk about social distancing, right, these social distancing measures, you know, not coming to contact with a lot of people um, and things like that, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, again, it's not an all or nothing question, just reduce that, right? Make it harder for the infectious agent to spread from one person to the next. That's, that's a way to think about mitigation. So as I mentioned, there's broadly two classes. One is the drugs and vaccines. We call these pharmaceutical interventions. We're all working on them very hard and we hope, we hope uh, that those will um, you know, be very effective and available soon. But in the meanwhile, we can do things with so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs. There's things we can do on the community level, and that's probably the big discussion that you'll see in the coming days and weeks. Travel restrictions, you know, does that make sense or not? I'm just mentioning it is, of course, something that works, right? Um, school closures, does that make sense or not? Again, you are basically, um, yeah, breaking apart some networks. Of course, you always have to be careful that you're not creating new networks somewhere where there, was, where there wasn't a network before. Um, rapid treatment of cases so that, uh, um, you know, if, if you can, obviously, so that there's less infection. Rapid case isolation, again, if you can. Uh, ventilation, as I meant, if airborne plays a big role. Um, it's important, right, to realize, and that's the really hard part now, there are always trade-offs. Every single one of these measures perhaps with the exception of ventilation, but ventilation costs money, so there's also a trade-off. Um, there is a quite serious trade-off. I mean, travel restrictions is a, a really serious, um, you know, limitation of, of personal freedoms, um, also comes with huge economic costs, as, as we're now seeing in many of these countries that have uh, substantially restricted um, school closures, same thing, right? 
it sounds good on a whiteboard. Let's close schools for two weeks. But, you know, if you're in any way attached to a family with kids, you know, there's a huge disruption, right, to the system. So you better be damn sure that um, this is going to be very effective. At the moment, we know of very few cases um, in kids. And so it's not quite clear, for example, what school closure could really do. But unfortunately, we don't really know um, are the kids nevertheless infectious or not. All of this stuff we have to figure out. Um, rapid treatment of cases and so on, I think these are no-brainers, but, but especially sort of the bigger ones, travel restrictions, uh, school closures and so on, you know, people canceling now events left and right. Um, you know, it can be the right thing to do, but we always have to be clear, this always comes at a heavy, heavy price. On the personal side of things, of course, there's a lot that we can do, right? I mean, we don't make decisions individually about school closure or travel restrictions, but of course we can decide to the extent that this is possible in our individual situations to distance ourselves a bit. Um, so we can self isolate, um, which is certainly a good idea. If you're sick, okay, don't go to work. Um, if you're extreme, you can of course also say, I'm gonna self quarantine. I don't know, I may be infectious. I may already have it, but that's probably uh, necessarily recommend that right now, unless you have really good reasons. But you know, this is something that people can do. Um, hand hygiene, very obvious one, right? And that's the one you'll hear a lot. Um, and, and for good reason, right? Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Respiratory etiquette, right? If you have to cough or sneeze, don't just do it like this and on the salad buffet and you know, what have you. Um, cough in either an, um, a tissue and then dispose it or cough ideally in your sleeve because you're not gonna touch a lot of uh, handles with your sleeve. Um, and other things, right? We'll probably enter into a phase where it would, you know, don't, don't take it personal if somebody refuses to shake hands with you um, or to kiss. Um, you know, for, for a sort of um, welcoming uh, ceremonial, right? It's not meant in any disrespectful way. Um, they're doing their part to, to make sure we have some mitigation going on. And this may vary, right? You may say, well, I think this is not, you know, a nice thing to do and I will still want to do it, um, right? We're not, this cannot be imposed, obviously, but but at least um, I would strongly invite you to respect others who do that. Um, another slide from the CDC, um, you know, when, if you're actually a, a public health official, when do you make these decisions? And these must be some of the hardest decisions to make. So, so certainly the, the federal office um, for public health is now in an extremely tricky situation. Um, and of course, not only ours, but anywhere across the world where they have to make these decisions. What do we do? And it, of course, it's almost guaranteed. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Um, they will be criticized no matter what. Uh, it's, it's probably an extremely hard job right now, but okay. Nevertheless, they are not just sitting around and taking this stuff, you know, pulling the stuff out of the air. The CDC, for example, has developed plans specifically for an influenza pandemic. And there they now use two scales. One is the scale measure of clinical severity and one is the scale measure of transmissibility. Right? Again, these two concepts, infectious disease. That's the disease part, that's the infection part. How bad is it? How transmissible is it? Um, in, so, in, in seasonal range, we think it's not so bad not so transmissible. For the pandemic ones, we've often seen turn out to be not so bad, still a bit transmissible. But we've also seen cases where it was both bad in terms of the severity and also rather transmissible. And so you can then come into these different modes, low, moderate, high, very high. They actually also have a class that's called extreme. Um, COVID, if you would just use these two um, classes is somewhere around here, right? I currently put it up here, literally off the chart, simply because the transmissibility seems to be um, higher or seems to be a six according to their definitions. But, you know, there's of course all kinds of things that matter. 
Um, the age distribution is very different in an influenza pandemic um, because kids can spread it a lot, which we're not sure about. So, but it's, it's probably somewhere around here. It's probably somewhere in this um, range. But in any case, this helps public health officials now to recommend certain things or in the worst case also to enforce, right? We have a, a law um, specifically for that, right? Um, that, that gives uh, also politicians and public health officials at certain points of time, certain legal rights to impose these, um, these, uh, these measures. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's not generally very helpful, I think, to compare uh, influenza with um, COVID, but there's nevertheless many lessons learned and, and ways at least to put this into perspective. So um, just um, yesterday, last night, there was, a, there was a press conference from the US CDC, right, Center for Disease Control. And I just want to read this to you because I thought it was quite interesting. The CDC urged American businesses and families to start preparing for the possibility of a bigger outbreak. Missonnier said that parents should ask their children's schools about plans for closures. Businesses should consider whether they can offer telecommuting options to their employees. Okay, we're talking about remote work. Um, while hospitals might need to look into expanding telehealth services, so sort of remote consultation. Disruption to everyday life might be severe, Ms. Nye said, adding that she talked to her children about the issue Tuesday morning. While I didn't think they were at risk right now, we as a family ought to be preparing for significant disruption to our lives. So that's some serious wording there, right? And that's the US CDC, so not just some crackpot somewhere. The CDC's messaging seemed to be at odds with the position of the World Health Organization, which reiterated Tuesday that countries could stop transmission chains if they acted swiftly and aggressively. So uh, the point here is not to say they are right and they are wrong. The point is to say we are now at this very interesting transition where clearly we have outbreaks and containment may just not work. And then if it doesn't work, we're looking at a pandemic and then it could go either way. So now, depending on where you position yourself on that spectrum, and also I guess what kind of message you wanna bring across, you can frame these things in a very different way. The WHO still at the moment, but again, morning of the 26th of February, seems to rather still treat this with an optimist point of view and say, well, we still, there's still a window, it's narrow, but there's still a window for us to, to contain this. Whereas the CDC now seems to have moved to the message that we cannot, or at least we may not. And in this case, right, we should already today start to think about how we're going to do this because it is true that multiple locations have managed to get things under control, China being one of them, um, Singapore being one of them. Very much hoping um, that South Korea is on the same trajectory, for example, and of course, and also Italy. But if you've read the news, which I'm sure you have, these goals have been achieved with rather, with rather significant um, and burdensome disruptions to the point where at some point even people were um, not allowed to leave their apartments and houses. So are we ready for that? Um, should we do that, right? These are very difficult questions and, and, uh, and we have to engage in them rather sooner than later. But this is just to show you, right, that there is no right or wrong at this point, but um, it, it seems to be, um, you know, it's an intense discussion. Some good news, um, trials are already underway, right? I mean, so people are definitely not sleeping on this, uh, certainly on the pharmaceutical front. Um, already there are trials underway for, in this case, the evaluation of remdesivir uh, in patients with serious illness. Um, and, you know, we hope to get some results about that by end of March, beginning of April. And, you know, who knows, some of this stuff may work. And that would, of course, be great. Okay, what are general reasons for hope? Um, well, CFR might be lower. Um, not a big hope to me right now, but could be. 
outbreak control may work and prevent sustained spread. That's, uh, that's still what the, it's the WHO messaging right now. Personally, I'm not quite on board with that. Just doesn't, doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence for that. Seasonality is something that people have been speaking about for some time that, oh, this thing will go away uh, as soon as it gets warmer, more humid, what have you. Um, very little evidence of that happening, right? Because this thing has been spreading in places like Singapore. And um, if you are confused about Singaporean climate, I encourage you to just look up a, a climate and humidity chart in Singapore and also the Middle East. So um, very little hope that the weather, the climate is just gonna um, deal with that. Um, personally, right, my, my bet is on this. Um, we can hope and try to do everything we can. And of course, we bring all the science to the table to really develop very quickly vaccines and drugs. Open questions, and then I spent the last five minutes on digital. Um, so again, crime scene, right? Lots of things we still don't know. Um, now, just that I'm not misinterpreted, of course, this is not a crime scene. Um, but it's like a crime scene where you're trying to fit the, the puzzle together. You know, what are the exact values and also the distribution of values for all the various quantities that we talked about in this lecture. Um, even if we know them, they're not just, you know, natural laws or some sort of, you know, natural constants, right? They depend on a lot of factors, such as CFR depending on age. Well, what are those factors? And what is the dependency? Can we do something about that, right? Can we mitigate? How common and infectious are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic carriers? We have very little knowledge about that. And there's obviously a huge gap in our knowledge. If there's fewer infectious, uh, infectious people that are asymptomatic, that's to some extent good um, because a lot of asymptomatic cases that are highly infectious would be, would be bad because then that means there's a lot of people that don't feel ill but that are actually highly infectious. And also what are risk factors for severe illness? Why is it that some people progress to critical disease or eventually even death and others don't. Okay, last five minutes, just a very quick plug for digital epidemiology. This is what I mostly do. Um, in the broad sense, this is epidemiology with digital data and digital tools. In the narrow sense, um, we're using a lot of digital data streams that were not actually created for epidemiological purposes. So I wanna show you an example for, I'm not sure if anyone would call this digital epidemiology, but I nevertheless want to uh, let you know about this wonderful web application called Next Strain um, that was developed out of the US and now Basel also. Uh, Richard Nair is one of the um, co-founders of this. He's at the Biocentrum in Basel. And so lots of people are now working on this where they're taking, um, you know, genomes that are um, made available and that now happens very quickly of the pathogens and then put them on this website and of course, not just as a list, but actually then do the analysis of that and you can sort of follow how does this thing evolve um, or not necessarily evolve, but you know, what is the, what is the phylogeny of these different um, genomes that you get? And there's all kinds of analyses you can do. And it's just a really great tool. And it just goes to show um, how quickly we can now do these things, right? Even just five, six years ago, um, putting up, you know, dozens or even hundreds of samples and, and uh, analyzing them in an online way would have taken weeks, if not even months. And now this happens in days, which is important because if there's one thing we have against pathogens, it's speed, right? So the internet, digital there, great help. Um, something more on the side of not using classical data or data that was um, created for, for epidemiological purposes is, of course, search data. Right? Google was not created for epidemiological purposes, but uh, as this paper showed a few years ago, um, 2009, Google claimed at the time to be able to detect or at least track influenza epidemics using search query data. So the idea being that as you start to become symptomatic, you start to Google things about the symptoms and now Google has that data and can see of course patterns of those search terms going up and down. And then, you know, with some analysis, um, try to show that this can really, um, you know, help us track this stuff relatively well. So 
they put an online system up, but it was eventually challenged and it was eventually shut down. Um, but a combination of data sources like that has, has shown good results. So even though Google flu trends itself is not sort of the big um, fish in the pond anymore, at least publicly, um, there's lots of work here by some colleagues in the US that show actually if you combine search and social media and traditional data sources, you can really uh, improve surveillance here. Just want to show you uh, before I finish our own work here on this that's right now very active. It's a system that we built some time ago. It's called CrowdBreaks. CrowdBreaks is a system that allows us to track trends and tweets and then and Twitter and then really also very rapidly start to ask all kinds of questions about that. So at the moment, you can see here the search, uh, the volume of coronavirus related tweets that is, uh, was a month ago pretty high when everybody started to talk about it, then it sort of got down. People were like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna get this under control. And in the past few days, um, a huge spike because people are now realizing, mm, we may actually not get this under control. Um, you can then search inside that data for search terms. And we're trying to s automatically, you know, detect trends on an hourly basis and some of them are useful, some of them are not useful, but at least, right, you get, you see what people are all of a sudden starting to talk about much more. At the moment, this may change in a few hours. People talk a lot about hashing and uh, soap, right? And then you also see sort of the major tweets about this, the tweets that most people are talking about, meaning, you know, retweeting and commenting and so on. And so that can very quickly give you an idea of what is currently being talked about and who are the major drivers. What we're also trying to do that this was actually the real um, idea of crowd breaks in the beginning is that we want to say, well, we have all kinds of questions about these tweets, right? We don't just want to read tweets that people wash hands. We have, for example, an interest in what is currently the expressed level of concern in the population? That's something you want to know, right? If you're a public health decision maker, you need to know, you know, are people worried, not worried? And so on Twitter, of course, people express that. So what we do is we're trying to build machine learning models, so concretely natural uh, language processing models that can look at the tweets and say, this is the level of concern, for example. Um, but in order to do that, we first need to annotate a lot of tweets for that, and then we can train models. So that's why we're using the system to ask people to help us annotate some of the tweets. So you just look at a tweet like this, you say, this is about the outbreak. And if yes, you know, what level of worry about this disease outbreak does this tweet express from very low to very high? But we can ask any question that we want. And um, this then allows us then to eventually train an algorithm that can do it on its own. So we can just then create real time information on such questions. And we do this in a continuous fashion because you have to do that because otherwise, right, the way we talk about coronavirus, for example, today may be very different than the way we talk about it in a month. So we continuously annotate and retrain the algorithm. That's a lot of work in progress. So that's it. I want to thank, of course, everyone in my lab. Martin Muller is a PhD student working on crowd breaks. Christian Althauser, Richard Neer, two um, colleague epidemiologists in Basel and Bern, who've also looked at some of these slides before. The compare to VEO is um, a research a community uh, that got a grant, a, a couple of uh, uh, European um, research groups. Um, and this was a grant on an emerging infectious diseases that started on the 1st of January, somewhat uncanny timing. Um, EPFL, of course, for funding and also all the colleagues on Twitter that uh, are rapidly engaged in information sharing, which is very helpful. Thank you.